Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlive.co.za. Well, good afternoon to Brand Live Radio and welcome to Creative, a radio program where we will be looking at various aspects surrounding the art world and artists. Today we have as my guests um, Mininkulu Ngoye, founding member of Alphabet Zoo. And then after him, we will be talking to Barry Fansell, senior manager at Alexander Forbes Retail. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Um, Mini, let's start with you. Please tell us a bit about yourself and where you come from. What led you to become an artist? Um, as Stefan said, I'm Mini Kulungoi. I was born in Soweto, raised in Soweto, and then I changed from my high school. For well, my high school years, I went to Alberton. Um, and then my high school art teacher said I should pursue art, and I thought I should because I was excelling. And then I went to Artist Proof Studio. Studied there for a few years, I think four years, two or no, three years, and then I worked in the gallery with a few other artists, and then got my own studio in 2012, and then we started off with Zoo properly. Actually started in 2010. Well, Alphabet Zoo is a collective of it was eight artists, now it's two artists. Um, we do publications in the form of zines, uh, posters, um, and other sorts of publications using different mediums such as source, basically printmaking. But yeah, we do other mediums as well. Okay, well, let's go back to your high school days. Your art teacher encouraging you. What did that mean for you, um, and how did it further develop you to actually take the big leap into becoming an artist? Because it is a scary place to be. Yeah. Um, as I said, I was excelling, right? So um, she should also encourage. So you know, when a lot of artists, when they start, they 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 know that they're not gonna make money out of this, right? That like, well, they're not gonna. It's it's negative, but yeah, they know. Or other artists don't know that they're gonna they will exhibit while they are alive, you know? So she would sometimes buy my works bit by bit and call people to buy my works and that, that made me feel, oh, okay, I can make money out of this. And didn't see it until I was in and I was like, hmm, I don't know. But yeah, I can't call that. <laughs> uh, do you want to give her a quick shout out? Oh yeah, Miss um, Armare, yeah. She, yeah. If she's listening. <laughs> so, now, after school, you obviously went to Artist Proof Studios. Tell us a bit about what is happening, what happened at Artist Proof Studios, and how that formed the foundation for um, where you eventually went to. Um, um, so Artist Proof, people don't realize that Artist Proof is actually one of the best uh, printmaking schools institution in uh, the country. Um, at first, I did not like printmaking. I just didn't understand why I would get my hands dirty to have a clean paper at the end and all of that. And then... Um, Later we did, um, I think my second year, if I'm not mistaken, we did a, um, a program, um, if I just forgot what it is now, with uh, Claudia, she's married, I forgot her surname, with Claudia, she was the soul screen, um, um, soul screen master, I guess. Okay, so that's Claudia Hartwig, and she runs with Chocolate Ink Studios. She changed her surname. Um, okay. Yeah, and, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me, and then um, we worked, um, with her, with her for about a year and a half and then eventually at an exhibition and that's that's when we learned silk screen and I thought wow um, a lot of I mean South Africa's got such a big history of silk screen makers and silk screening um, as a medium on its own so it, it actually showed me that I was in the right part of uh, my practice. Okay, so just for those people that don't know, tell us about about what it entails to make a silk screen print. Um, well, wow. um, a silk screen. Pr the the easiest way. Well, the easiest way to explain silk screen is, I mean, to a normal person at home, um, I'll just tell you um, that people you can get a T-shirt out of silk screen. I think that's the easiest way of people understanding the medium. But silk screen is part of a lot of mediums in printmaking. So, um, the process is you'd have to work on film, whether digitally or not. So you design something and then design whatever image you want and then you transfer it to film. Film mean we call it acetate, but film that see through paper that almost looks like transparency. From there you coat your screen with Martian, you put it in the uh, in the dark room. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna ask you to take a step yeah. back because I know the process as yes. well. So, <laughs> so once so, <laughs> so once you have the film yes. and your screen is coated with a photographic emulsion, yes. you put the image on the screen. 
you first put the you first put your um, emulsion in the dark room for a yeah. while so that it dries up. So you must make sure that it's in the dark because it's photo it's photo light. So if you it was it light fast or photo? If you put it in the sun, then it will expose or the image will come out, um, or it won't work. And then you put your image um, reverse on your screen, your flat screen, um, and then um, you expose it in. A UV light uh, through a UV light that's uh, it's quite strong. It's almost like sunlight. It's very strong. And then you wait for a few minutes, depending on how how dense or how depending on your lines. If your lines are bold, then you it's for longer longer time. Uh, if it's if your lines are very crisp, uh, it's less time. And then you wash it off <coughs> with just plain water. And then yeah, then you will need something called a squeegee, your ink, and yeah, and a flat surface. It has to be a flat surface. Um, you can challenge yourself, but then your screen might break if you use a different kind of surface or surface that's uneven. Um, I hope that explains it. So in essence, once your image is on the screen, the parts that have not been hardened by the light, yes. that wash washes off so it leaves clear areas. Mm -hmm. And once you put the ink on the screen, you can push the ink through the open spaces. So the negative, so when it exposes, it exposes negatively. So so what you see on your screen is negative to what the image is going to come out of. The opposite. The opposite, basically. Okay. <laughs> but that's not all you can do with a silk screen. I mean, you can use templates, you can use masks. Okay. Yeah, you can do a lot. Yeah, you can use stencils. Um, you can, there's, there's so many. So with printmaking, depending on how you look at it. So with silk screen, you can go into making so many different kinds of images. That would look, look, you can make a print, uh, a silk screen print look like a painting. It just, it's just you challenging yourself and trying to explore the medium itself. Okay, and also I know for a fact that Artsproof Studios sometimes encourages people to make books. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much where the idea from the zin comes from. Mm -hmm. Now, can, can you explain to us what a zin is? Um, a zine, um, zine, Z-I-N-E. Um, me and my partner Isaac from Alphabet Zoo always, when we do workshops, we always explain it like so. How you put uh, the whole word magazine, so you just take the mega out and have zine. So zine is a publication basically, and it's, so it's a self-made published publication. It's a self-made publication, and it's, it's self-published. It's a self-made self-published publication. Yeah, um, it's a lot of yeah. So a lot of people don't do independent publishing. Um, it's a very niche market, so we thought we should um, get into that, and it's been it's been very. Very interesting. I mean, we've got quite a big collection of zines, and we, um, we, yeah, I don't want to say what we want to do with it. So, in essence, it falls into the genre of the artist book. Basically, yes. An, yeah. an artwork that f takes the f form of, the, of a book, but has been created by the artist from start to finish. Exactly. I only found out later that it's an artist book, which yeah, it's very fascinating. Now we will be having it. Okay. So let's quickly jump over to Alphabet Zoo. It started in 2010, unofficially or officially? It was quite unofficial. So in 2010, while we were studying, so about eight of us uh, found out that there was a press at uh, Johannes Beck Art Gallery. It was like an abandoned press and we thought, no, we can print here except at school. So every Fridays we'd meet at um, the, the Jubat Park and discuss about collectives and collectivity and all of that. At the time, there wasn't a lot of Jubat collectives uh, that are printmakers or not just artists in general. And then over the years, we started showcasing work in different coffee shops and small galleries. Uh, people, just, people just started doing their own projects. And then it was just me and Isaac left. And we thought, yeah, let's, let's be serious about this. And, yeah, and make workshops and make art. Tell us more about the workshops you do and tell us about how you engage, particularly because there's a connection between almost urban art, street art, and off-bed zoo. Um, yeah, so most of, most of the, the workshops we've done over the years, it's very, I, I wouldn't call it street artish, uh, if, there is, if there is a word called street art, but for me it's still graffiti. Um, I would call it more like, it's more informal, so when people come to our workshops, we would relax, not even try, give them name tags, or you know, if you want to bring a beer, you can have a beer while, we, while we're workshopping you. Um, we'd give you themes, depending on what's happening at the time, or sometimes we'd, we'd get a theme from, from the participants, so we'd, um, what's this, uh, we'd throw names or themes in hats, and then we'll select the best themes, and then we'll work from there. We normally do um, small zines, when, well, for beginners, we do um, A4 zines, where you fold it a few times, it makes like about eight pages, including the cover and back page. 
and then you get your more high, high end Z depending on the budgets and yeah. Yeah. Okay, so just to give a bit of context, a zin is pretty much an A4 sheet of paper that you fold in a particular pattern mm -hmm. with one cut in the middle that you fold into a book form. But that's th that's pretty much the easiest in my personal experience as well. So, in your workshops, what do you normally cover in your workshops, and how regularly do you have your workshops? We, depending on the theme, right, so we'd, we'd normally cover ways of folding zines, or depending on the time and the theme, would would. so we'd have like a, if we have like a few hours, like a one-day workshop, we'd make like a small zine, if we have like a three-day workshop, we'd have like a more, uh, better, more pages and more high-end zine, sometimes if we have two days, we'd make everybody collaborate in one big um, publication or one big zine. Um, what else? Um, we've, yo, it's it's very random. We don't have we don't have workshops like on certain days. Uh, it's very hard to get people to come um, do free workshops or like pay for workshops because they basically don't know what it is. So we'd have to maybe do do three or two. I mean two in every three months or one in like one um, once a month or once. Yeah, yeah. You can't. It's very hard to have them like weekly or monthly or you know because yeah because people. Mostly people don't want to pay, but people don't, <laughs> people don't understand. But it's getting there. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to give up now. Well, I have to admit, I have a substantial collection of your zins, which I'm quite proud of. Well, <laughs> we need to talk about that yeah. later. So, now, tell us a bit more about Isaac, because unfortunately he can't be here, and he's part and parcel of what you guys do. Um, Isaac's away right now. He's been gone for two months. Uh, um, he's coming back soon though. Um, Isaac, um, so me and Isaac's work um, is very, it's not similar. So as, as Alphabet Zoo, we do kind of similar work because we collaborate. But um, we, our work, both of our work is different and we tackle almost the same themes like psycho, uh, political kind of work. Um, so he would use mostly animals, I'll use animals and figures. Um, reasons being that um, is because um, at Artist Proof we, we would see a lot of portraiture and figures and you know. And we thought which way of being different except doing the, the normal or the what, what everybody's doing so we just thought of yeah working differently like that using a lot of different mediums to make a print um yeah he's coming back soon though i don't know i, I, I wanted to speak for himself <laughs> <laughs> well it's, i have to admit that i love calling you guys the naughty boys <laughs> so now if people want to find out about you guys, when your next workshop is, and how you, how do you go about joining a workshop? Where do they go to? Uh, we're on Instagram. Um, we actually <coughs> normally don't really advertise that much on Instagram. We just show um, what we've been up to, and we do uh, something called Zine of the Week, where we just it's almost like a review of a zine, or just just to almost profile people's zines because nobody's doing that in the country right now. Um, and we're on Facebook. Um, it's just alphabet zoo on facebook and on instagram it's alphabet zoo underscore i mean alphabet underscore zoo just like twitter um and tumblr um we've got a few workshops coming we actually busy with a project at guta the guta institution in Jan Smas right now it's been going on for almost six months now it's called the reading room that's where we can see our zines there's another thing we're doing with the french institution coming up in september it's a festival it's like a literature festival if i'm not mistaken so we're going to do um two workshops in on one day um, so one is um, toy paper printing, silk screen workshop, and um, a small zine workshop. I am not really sure about the dates. Uh, please <coughs> excuse me <laughs> and apologize about that. And we've got another show coming up in September with the Bubblegum Club. It's just a zine show. We will showcase our personal zines and about four other zine makers from our collection. Yeah. Okay. Now, <coughs> excuse me. I have to ask. Now. You have a own private collection because you trade artwork with other artists, correct? Yeah. How do you see that little collection? Um, so our plan, you see, I didn't want to talk about it. <laughs> our, plan was, our plan is to get as, as enough zines, well, it keeps on growing. So our plan is to get enough zines uh, from um, the country, if not the continent. Um, I mean, Africa, if not the, the country. Um, get this collection and try show it all over the world if possible so that uh, people can know what we're doing down here and 
not only for travelers, of course, but so that people know what we do down here and then swap zines from that side to eventually have our own zine fest um, offer. I'm, I'm glad to hear that, but I was actually asking about your own collection because artists, because uh, artists generally trade with each other. Yeah, um, some some make you buy. Um, Well, I think we're quickly going to go for an ad break, then we can continue that conversation. Thank you. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. Live from 27 boxes in the heart of Melville, this is brandlive.co.za. The unique experience. Living as One Events presents Relationship Talks, Drama. Q&A sessions, music, love stories, ladies and gents session, and lots more. Registration fee at 150 rand. Happening at Bread of Life Foundation Venue, Honeydew Shopping Center, Bayers Nodier Drive, Corner Bloomberry Drive, Unit 66, Laser Park, Honeydew. Saturday, 15 September at 11 a.m. RSVP on 072-851-8702. Tuli, looks so beautiful. Hey, long time no see. What happened to your skin, by the way? The last time I saw you, you had a lot of blemishes and breakouts. It was so terrible, man. Wow, thanks for that, Bernard. Luckily, I discovered DMK. Have you heard of DMK? DMK? Who are they? DMK is a paramedical skincare brand that specializes in all skin conditions. Would you like their number? Yes, please. I know you're not good at numbers, so let me give you their website address because your skin looks terrible. It's www.dmkskincare.co.za. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. Well, welcome back from that short ad break. Now, Minnie, you have an art collection because we all, all artists trade with each other. As what do you see that collection? Because the general consensus is an art collection is either for financial benefit or it is for the love of art. Um, for me, it's an investment. Um, most of the works that I've collected is, is for an investment, which is very tricky because you never know how the artists are going to progress over the years or, you know, or how long they're going to be around in the game. So, yeah. And sometimes you, sometimes you just collect because you like the person or you like the work. So it just differs who who wants to swap and why am I swapping with them. Okay. Now, bearing on that, do you have any other types of investments? Nope. To be honest, no. Okay. Do you, do you at least have a will? Not even. No, not, not that I know. And that is... No, and that is precisely why we switch over to Barry Fancel, Senior Manager at Alexander Forbes Retail. Hi, Barry. Hi, Stefan. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. Now, before we even start on the financial side, I know you have a collection. A very small one. Starting off, mm -hmm. how do you see your collection? Look, from, uh, on, a, on a personal note, um, you know, obviously I, I do have a lot of uh, other assets and financial you know, um, uh, assets as well. But uh, for me, I started the collection for art because I do love art as well. So my collection, you're right, I, uh, it's, it's a small collection as such. Uh, I still do not know, you know the artist world and, and, and who are the most valuable artists out there. Uh, so I basically started off by saying, you know, what is visually pleasant to me? What do I like? Uh, what do I like to see hanging on my walls? And that's basically how I started uh, you know, my small collection. But at the end of the day, uh, every single artwork still does have some, some form of value attached to it. So whether or not you... You just, uh, you know, it's visually pleasing and, and you like, you know, it's seeing on your wall. Uh, there's still a monetary value attached to that. And uh, I also would want my art collection to grow from a monetary perspective as well. Okay, so in essence, it's almost like buying shares, if, if one can equate it to that. Because you need to do your research before you buy any shares. Correct. And then obviously you need to keep an eye on it. The same goes for artwork. Now, we have Mini still here. As... In his case, obviously, what advice would you give him? Because I know he's he wants to start investing 
in something else other than art? What mm. type of advice? Look, I mean, generally, um, you know, you can put a blanket of advice over to, to anybody, but, but generally speaking, you need to have very personal advice when it comes to your financial planning. So um, in, in our world, art is still seen as, as pretty much an asset class. It's still an investment that you can make, and it needs to form part of a, a broader holistic picture of your, 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 your sort of financial journey, your, your financial well-being. So it's all good and well that you're sitting with 100 art pieces, um, but what is your plan with that? Are you planning on selling it one day? Are you planning to retire with that one day? Um, how do you want to leave it? Do you have beneficiaries? Do you have kids that, you, that it needs to go to? Um, you know, do you have a will in place that the executor knows what to do with those assets? Um, the, other, the, the flip side of that as well is that with, with any kind of investment, it's very dangerous to start putting all of your eggs in one basket. So if you're only going to invest in art, uh, you know, there's, there's going to be risks attached to that as well. You know, where do you store it? Do you have insurance on it? What happens if there's a, you know, a flood or you know, your house burns down, etc.? So there's risks attached to that as well. So just with any other asset class, diversification is key. You know, it's always good to have uh, you know, some, time of, some kind of retirement savings as well. There's you know, saving for your kids' education. Um, you know, and obviously then the artwork will make up one element of your total you know, financial planning uh, position. So I would always suggest don't just go into one, just like with chairs, you know, it's always risky just to go into one asset class. The same basically applies to, to art as well. Okay, then my next question is, I mean, obviously artists lives from exhibition to exhibition or from commission to commission. And one of the things I've noticed is if you go, unless, of course, you buy shares, if you go into trying to invest in a retirement annuity or whatever, there needs to be a monthly payment. It isn't always easy for artists to do that. Is there any other way that artists can explore various ways of trying to engage with those sort of investment products absolutely look you know uh, the, the traditional investments like retirement annuities um, endowments unit trusts you know they're still around but they there's there's um, asset managers are actually looking at various ways that people can invest in those so a lot of the products do you know requ require that you put a a monthly sort of you know amount away but mm -hmm. they also do understand that a lot of entrepreneurs artists etc um that don't have necessarily that coming through on a monthly basis it's quite erratic how the the income comes in so there are some products available out there where you can maybe just say you know every time that i do you know work and i get some commission i will just take a third of that basically and, and put it into that product and, and and top it up as as you go go along so it's not necessarily the case that you have to put away you know money monthly but it's again having that balance and just saying well you know with any money coming in how am i going to treat that money am i going to take a third and save it i'm going to take a third and and you know pay off debts or whatever or i'm going to take a third or half of it to reinvest back into my business buy some more materials etc but the biggest thing is to have that balance have that that budgeting like with any other thing you know in life you have to plan accordingly and then take it basically one step at a time okay so um if if there are people that want to find out about how to engage with that Obviously, Alexander Forbes would be a place to go to. Yeah, we definitely have some experts in that field. Um, like I said in the beginning, you know, we we really look at at everything. You know, even with art collectors, um, we we look at their position holistically. So we look at everything that they've got, even if they do have, you know, some, you know, collectible stamps, Krugerrands, artwork. For us, the biggest thing is that uh, you know people need to just be able to put a value to that. So if you're going to do a evaluation on your your artwork, we need to know what it's what is it worth, and also what is what is the end goal here you know are you basically just collecting as m many artworks as possible um, in the hope that they they gain value are you speculating on it or are you buying really really niche artworks that you know will grow in time and then what is what is what is the plan you know we, we talk to clients where they they buy the artwork and they've got a substantial amount of art but they reluctant to sell it they don't want to sell it so they're saying well it's it's part of my retirement plan but then when they get to retirement they don't <laughs> want to get rid of their artwork so th there's you, you have to have a personal conversation and sit down with somebody and really sort of work out what is it that you that you want to do um, and and obviously yeah the, if you want to speak to an expert um, people can get hold of me directly uh, my, my my contact number is zero one one two six nine zero four eight zero 
My email address is fanzaleba at aforbes.co.za. Um, and uh, they can just contact me and I will definitely put them in touch with an expert that they can sit down with and discuss everything from how do you budget, how do you draft a will, what is your personal circumstances, how do you navigate through through everything in life, um, and also from an entrepreneurial perspective, if they need help with you know business insurance um, or insurance of their products, you know we can put them in touch with the right people um, to ensure that whatever their plans, their goals, their expectations are, we can actually take it forward for them. No, I think that's that's absolutely fantastic. Just purely from the point of view that an artist is in essence an entrepreneur, and they need to work out where they're planning to go. And I mean, I'm quite freely admit that I'm one of those terrible ones that are not always paying attention to these things, but I know that's going to change very soon. Now, Barry, apart from collecting and apart from managing. You also have another hobby. Tell us about <laughs> that. <laughs> uh, you promise that's not going to come up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, it has to. It has so, to. Yeah, so my, my hobby, unlike most people that's, that's in the financial services industry that play golf and squash, etc., um, I actually play drums and uh, I, I DJ on old school vinyls. Okay, and where can people hear that part of you? Well, strangely enough, since we're sitting in, in Melville here at 27 Boxes, I will be playing this Sunday from 2 to 5 at Hell's Kitchen here in Melville. Perfect. And as always, I will be there to support. Now, we're coming to the end of the program, and I would remind all the listeners, if you want us to cover any topics or discuss any things, please feel free to drop me a message on my Facebook page, Creative Fine Art. And just a reminder, there is a f- all-women's exhibition opening tomorrow night at Studio Facture, co-curated by Creative Fine Art. At 27 Boxes Marvel. Please feel free to drop in and join us for a glass of wine. And with that, goodbye. You're listening to brandlive.co.za. And what we have for you is Does the age gap really matter in sexual relationships? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, you look at Zoto Wabantu and uh, you know he her her Ben 10 and you ask yourself so many questions that yeah. this old woman dating this young baby yeah. and maybe it's you know because he's probably mature. Who yeah. knows? Now if you both are on the same level of maturity, like I mentioned, don't let the attached age number cloud your decision. Because here's the thing, it could be your you know the person that you're gonna spend the rest of your life with, but because of society and you think brandlive.co.za in the convo corner. Check this out. Brandlive.co.za. Sure, we're not supposed to keep things basic in Tanga. We gotta go next level. I come to the new windows. You cannot block this the whole time. I cop this is monstrous, just like the Loch Ness. Huh. It's just the softness of heart, just like a rock is. Making all the ruckus, you still flag my G. Now tell me what the fuck is why he do me for my darkness. Tell me what the shock is, your timing and where the clock is. Oh my god! Brandlive.co.za <laughs> Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za Stay, I'm in need. Don't you leave, guarantee. Lay down on me. Harnessing the power of talk radio. Brandlive.co.za